be here this morning. I'm going to echo some of the sentiments that have come out this week and uh, pass on my thanks to Garrick and the Starmus team uh, for inviting me and my family uh, to join this celebration. Uh, as a believer in this wonderful intersection between science and art, I don't think there's a better place to be. I'd also like to thank our Apollo heroes and friends for being here and sharing their stories with us as we celebrate this 50th anniversary of Apollo, and not just looking back at the legacy, but how Apollo, reflecting on it in a way that leads us to the future as well, because I think it does. Uh, all the artists and scientists here today, thank you. Uh, I think that the stories that are coming out in all of the presentations show the blend of both of these things. And we had a really amazing celebration on Monday night with that concert, which I think just brought it so to life. Uh, and I don't know if you saw the art that was up on the stage for a couple of the days by Chris Kelly, which was really wonderful. And his dad, Paul, actually was an artist who was in the room with all of the Apollo crews, uh, just documenting through his drawings the story of Apollo and what went on with that. Um, so very thankful to be here. I'm going to start out today sharing a little bit about how I got into the whole space thing and then focus a little bit more on this idea of Earth from space with, you can see I've got the ART capitalized in color uh, because I think there really is a, an artistic expression of Earth from space as well and my life now has blended uh, space and art together in a way that I hope you'll find interesting too. Use the clicker. Okay, this picture. I get asked a lot of times, well, what was it like to be in space? And this one picture to me really kind of wraps it all up in, in a simple, beautiful way. Uh, this image looks very still. Uh, you see the silhouette of the space shuttle Atlantis. And while it looks still, I know that we're traveling at 17,500 miles an hour or five miles a second or every 90 minutes circling the planet. And when you do that, about every 45 minutes, you get one of these stunning sunrises or sunsets out the window. I also know that on that little silhouetted Atlantis, I'm there with my five crewmates. Uh, we've completed a successful mission. It was my first time in space. We're going home to our families uh, after that. And I also know that my crewmate, Jeff Williams, who I shared a couple months with already on the space station, was still there finishing his mission and was taking this really great picture for me to remember the experience by. But when I look at it, I also consider this feeling that I had in space, which was this sense of being separated, you know, separated from Earth in a way that I might not have ever experienced again, but at the same time more connected to everything and everyone below me than I had ever really felt when I was right down in the middle of it. And through that, uh, you know, through this complexity that we're doing up there and that view through the window, I really came back with three very simple lessons that I'll try to share throughout this presentation in one way or another today, which is that, uh, and we all intellectually know these things, uh, we live on a planet, we are all Earthlings, and the only border that matters is that thin blue line of atmosphere that blankets us all. Now, I think everyone in this room was inspired in some way, whether it's artistically, scientifically, blending those two together, or just to come here and experience uh, the, the presentations and the, the wonder of what we've, we've seen this week. Uh, for me, uh, at, back to the beginning, my parents, I just felt like always shared what they loved with me, which opened up the opportunity for me to figure out what I liked and didn't like about what they did, but also to discover the things that might be you know, interesting to me for my future. Uh, my dad built and flew small airplanes while I was growing up. So as a family, we spent all kinds of time out at the airport with him. And I developed a love for flying and for wanting to know how things fly. Uh, as that inspiration grew, uh, I ultimately was chosen into the astronaut office. And I can tell you, having a family that supports you all along the way is uh, a really important thing, especially when you're doing something that they might not want to do themselves or that they might think is really kind of dangerous, which it is. And a couple of these pictures are of my mom and sisters at my first launch, uh, my husband and son after uh, my first launch, and then my husband and son on the airplane, <clears throat> excuse me, on our ride home uh, from Florida to Houston. 
It's much more difficult for your family and friends to watch you do something like this than it is to be the one strapping into the rocket to do it. Uh, in that same vein of how my parents shared with me what they loved, um, my husband and I are trying to do the same thing with our son. And so throughout the training experience, we would try to get him out to as many of the different kinds of training sessions as possible. Usually the ones where we're in the really cool suits and doing you know, stuff in the swimming pool to learn how to do a spacewalk or how to fly the robotic arm or in the simulators, because honestly, I think the academic class probably would have been too appealing to him, but um, just to share that same kind of thing so that he could see what we enjoy and maybe get something out of it. Uh, I would also like to mention, I'd be remiss if I didn't do this, um, uh, today is my 22nd wedding anniversary, so happy anniversary, Chris. <laughs> Um, very quickly, I, before becoming an astronaut, spent 10 years working on both the space shuttle and the space station program at Kennedy Space Center and had this wonderful opportunity to get up close and personal with the hardware. I had jobs in the Launch Control Center and the Orbiter Processing Facility, and you can see here uh, out on the runway after an Endeavour landing. And what I really want to share about this picture, though, kind of follows along to the teaming discussions we've had throughout the week is that these people that I'm standing there with, these people that I worked with throughout uh, my time at um, Kennedy Space Center and Johnson Space Center, they believed that the care and feeding of those spacecraft and preparing them for the crew was their job, their responsibility. And it's really great to work with a group of people like that. And a motto that I have on every office wall that I've ever had since then is the one you see on the screen, which is here's how we can, not why we can't, uh, is just built into everything we do. And I try to use that in everything I do now, because I think when you have conversations with people from that perspective, starting with that kind of message, it's amazing what can get done instead of going into something with some kind of conflict. All right, so I show you this picture because Oh my gosh, it's the most beautiful picture I've ever seen of a space shuttle rolling out uh, from the vehicle assembly building to the launch pad. Uh, this was the shuttle Discovery on its way to the pad for the final mission, STS-133. I think that when you think about science and art, this is a beautiful photo. It is a wonderfully artistic photo. Uh, when I look at it, it seems almost like simply beautiful. But there is complexity in every place you pick on this picture. I don't care if it's the tip of the tank or the tread of the crawler transporter. It's almost like unimaginable complexity that we as human beings can create and build these kinds of things. But it's right there, and I was very fortunate to get to fly on it. In preparation for going to space, uh, we do a lot of things. I'm trying not to show all the stuff that, um, that you've seen throughout the week, but uh, I, have to, I have to show this. Uh, because I feel like I had this opportunity, like I was blessed to go live and experience what we call inner space in order to learn how to live and work in outer space. And there was no better preparation, I didn't think, all kind of wrapped up into one mission than these Aquarius undersea missions we did. And I had the opportunity to live there um, for three weeks and we were doing uh, all the same kinds of things that we would do on a space station. You're in an extreme environment where you can't just swim to the surface if something goes wrong. You have to deal with it at 60 feet underwater. Uh, and uh, the, the work we were doing was as close as you could get to what you would be doing in a module on a space station. And I highly recommend this too, in addition to the flying in space. So I spent my time in space on the space shuttle, and also the bulk of it on this masterpiece, the International Space Station. And I honestly could talk all day about this one picture. When you look at it, I mean, there is no better example of living off the grid than this space station. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, you know, the systems that, that run everything for us, you know, those big solar arrays collecting all of that solar energy and generating our electricity, uh, I think somebody earlier spoke about the today's coffee becomes tomorrow's coffee thing. You know, the ideal and recycling all of the, the moisture that you have in your air or wherever else it comes from. Uh, we are acutely aware every day of how much CO2 is in our atmosphere and managing that. Uh, we are doing everything we can to make sure that this mechanical system that we've built and put in space 
mimics as closely as possible to what Earth does for us naturally. And I would argue that for a number of reasons, including perhaps the scientific ones that we use this station for, that um, the international relationships we've established through these over 20 years of working peacefully and successfully with crew members and tens of thousands of people on the ground across 15 different nations is a really significant thing. And that this machine we built that mimics what Earth does for us naturally, all of those things are the most wonderful example of how we should be living and working down here as crew of Spaceship Earth. All right, this is absolutely one of my very favorite pictures from space. And Moi Kamandia, Gennady Padalka is here today. And so, yep, waving hi, Gennady. Um, how cool is it to be able to go to space and be with a group of people that you know you are gonna enjoy your time with? That you know the personality of all these people is gonna come out and you're gonna be able to experience that as part of this really amazing thing called space flight. And then at the same time, know that every single one of those people in this picture will have your back when it hits the fan. When things don't go as planned, they are going to be there for you. You hope that they trust that you're going to be for, there for them and behave like the professional that needs to be there to make all of the missions successful and to really you know, respond to those emergencies that will happen when you're there. And I absolutely feel like that's what I have with these people in space. Uh, I wish we could go back again together and take our families with us because it would be so awesome. Uh, I don't know if you noticed, in this picture there's, we have red clown noses on. Uh, this is not our official NASA photo. In fact, NASA wasn't real happy with this photo at first, but I use it. <laughs> I think there's something about including the human in human spaceflight and recognizing that we are humans uh, doing the spaceflight. Uh, those nose noses were provided to us by the gentleman that is second um, from the left in the front row, Guy La Liberté. Uh, he was uh, a spaceflight participant, joined us for about 10 days on the station, founder, owner of Cirque du Soleil, and also the founder of the One Drop Foundation, which is all about educating and providing clean water to people around the world. And he considers himself a clown, so he brought this for us. But we built that space station in space as a life support system so that we can live and work there as a crew. And while I'm not a scientist, I'm an engineer, I like to fly, by my background, the operator, I think, um, I got to play one in space. And every day, there are hundreds of different research activities going on up there in pretty much any area of science that you can imagine. And so I just show these quickly to say that we are the experiment when we're in space. Uh, we want to know what's happening to us when we're up there. And we get to work with all different kinds of things. You know, you're fixing the toilet one day and doing um, combustion chamber experiments the next or spacewalk or whatever. And the bottom left picture really is just to remind us that while it might not be the perfect microgravity or zero gravity, we are able to take gravity out of the equation in a way that allows us to learn new things about stuff we already thought we knew a lot about. And I think that's pretty important. Um, this is my obligatory, I got to do a spacewalk um, picture. Uh, and I show it, uh, there, there's a couple reasons. One is because the picture in the bottom left is the one my mom says reminds her of why she was afraid while I was in space. <laughs> and she, you know, I look at it now and I think, oh, you know, I was out at the end of Columbus, we were about to take this, you know, this payload off the end, and you know, all this, I'm thinking about what the operation was when we were there. And she's thinking about the fact that I only have one hand on the space station, and there's all this black, you know, all around the whole thing. And in her mind, there should always be a two hands on the space station, but um, really, it, it, Surreal and so real are the things that I think about when I remember flying in space. It is so real to me, and yet it is totally surreal to me. And the fact that in this other picture, which I got from the video that wouldn't play, so it's just a still image. Um, like Garrett, I got to ride from one end of the station, sweeping, you know, this big windshield wiper maneuver is what they call it. So at some point, you're the farthest person from the planet, you know, not quite the moon but, um, you know, pretty far up there, and then down into the payload bay of the space shuttle. And that was pretty awesome. And like Rusty said, you know, he had that time to just appreciate where he was, to be human out there, 
I felt that happen to me too. And it was the most peaceful thing to be on the end of this arm, holding on to this box that would have on the ground weighed about 900 pounds, but I could have done you know, anything I wanted with it, and to be so still and quiet. And I never felt like I was moving. And I don't know if that's because Kevin Ford is just such an amazing flyer of the robotic arm or if that's just the way it's supposed to be. But I felt like I was standing there on this floor and the station moved out of my view and the earth rotated up into my view and then all of a sudden there was this payload bay of the space shuttle for about 25 minutes. It was incredible. All right, so I'm going to shift a little bit to looking out the window. Um, I can tell you, I got to space and I didn't really think about the fact that we live on a planet. I knew it, but this planet Earthling, thin blue line thing, was not something that was like part of my consciousness every day. But when I got to space and looked out the window, it was this reality check of who and where we are. And I'm very thankful for this picture, it's one of my favorites. Uh, I was inside uh, bossing two guys around, Steve and Al, as they did their spacewalk, and Steve very kindly uh, took this picture of me. It reminds me that I was there, that I had this opportunity. And when I looked out the window, there was kind of this evolution in looking out the window. Uh, when I got to space, everybody asked, what was the first thing you saw when you floated up into the window? What was the first thing you saw when you looked out? And honestly, I don't remember. I know there was water, <laughs> and it was really beautiful, and I was like overwhelmingly impressed by this clarity and color and glowing that I saw out there, but I don't remember what it was. But I knew at some point I wanted to see Florida from space. I consider Florida my home. It was this familiar thing that I was looking for out the window. I wanted to see it. If I knew we were flying over it, I tried to get my face in front of the window to see it and take a picture of it. And then being up there, looking through that window, which I tried to do as much as possible, and again, I can confirm that, um, it really, it really was like it went from looking for the familiar to getting your brain wrapped around something like this. This is Al crawling along the bottom of the space station. And at first your brain tells you, oh my gosh, why is an Al falling off? You know, 250 miles back to the Earth. And then you realize, wow, Al just feels like he's crawling along the floor. He doesn't get any sense of up or down or falling. And then there was a geography lesson. And Gennady, absolutely the best at finding the pyramids, at taking these pictures, at you know, seeing it before the rest of us did and then showing us uh, where it was so that we could see it too. And learning the planet in a way, really wonderful geography lesson. And then over time, it became, I, I almost like Earth as art appreciation. <laughs> it was like, every time you look out the window, there was a surprise. It does not matter if you're flying over the same place again, you will see something different about it. And on the station, you know, just like I could hold that 900 pound box, these big lenses on these cameras are really easy. There's nothing to it. You just, you know, the ones you'd need a tripod for down here, you just use them. So we had these 400, 800, even I think on the Russian segment, there was a thousand millimeter lens that you could use to really zoom in. And I remember finding this little heart-shaped island in the middle of the Red Sea. And when I saw that, I was like, oh my gosh. God must have a really wonderful sense of humor. Because there are things like this all over the planet. If you look at the Amazon River the right way, floating in the window, it's like the river, it looks like a profile of an elephant with its trunk up. Out in the middle of the um, South Pacific, there's these atolls everywhere. And there's this one area where it literally looks like footprints, like somebody has walked across the ocean. You know, there's seahorse-shaped islands, all these things. I think it was just this really great way presented to me to say, wow, we are curious and we want to find these things. And I think these are here for us to find them. And my very favorite picture that I took while I was on, on station was this um, picture of a little tiny chain of islands on the northern coast of Venezuela called Las Rocas. And that image uh, inspired me um, for what I painted in space. Uh, I brought up a little watercolor kit with me. I only painted the one painting, and judge it all you want. It's not like the finest art uh, on the planet or off. Um, but it was a real human experience for me to be able to do something that I really enjoy on Earth, to do that in space, and then bring it back. And it has been the way that I've tried since retiring from NASA to use art to share my spaceflight experience. 
And to do that in a way that people know we have a space station, because in this audience I know this isn't true, but there are places where people don't know we have this International Space Station, and they should know, because everything we're doing there is about improving life on Earth. And I also want them to get this sense of, we live on a planet, we're all Earthlings in the thin blue line. So I will say, I painted the first watercolor in space, but art has been in space since the beginning of us flying in space. Uh, I don't know if any of you have seen this before, this is Alexei Leonov on his flights, the top left, the sketch, the simple pencil sketch of uh, an orbital sunrise that he did. And very thoughtfully, he brought up his pencils with, you know, all rigged to be able to work with it in microgravity. And on the Apollo-Soyuz flights, he did portrait sketches of all of his crew members. And that's one that he's holding of his best friend, Tom Stafford. My, I think, hero from the standpoint of not just spaceflight, but also art, um, the late Al Bean, um, really sad that he's not with us now, but who was the first, I think, to really transition this, this amazing career as an astronaut to become an artist. And every day on Space Station, there's something artistic going on. You saw Chris Hadfield earlier this week. He played his guitar on station. Uh, I painted. We've had musical instruments up there since, you know, since we've been flying. Um, these guys recently did this jam session on the station. And Ricky Arnold is bongo drumming on one of our um, solid waste collection. Um, so multi-purpose, hopefully empty one, although I guess you get different sound depending on how full they are. Anyway, art and the human kind of spirit of things has been in space forever. I don't think we can deny it. And then I found it so cool to discover that, you know, there's all these hidden talents in people. I think there is a blend in all of us and that we all should be using our whole brains when we're trying to solve the most challenging problems that we have here on Earth. But to discover that Mike Collins is a painter, that was so cool to me. And that picture in the top left, he calls it Tranquility Base. It has nothing to do with the moon, but it, maybe it's his expression of what he felt when he was you know, seeing the moon from his vantage point. And he tends to do nature paintings. And I love this one called Snook One Launch, which is a snook launching from um, Kennedy Space Center. And then to discover that the American father of rocketry, Robert Goddard, was a painter. And he painted these scenes of like New Mexico and Arizona. And I never knew that. I think that's so cool. In my life now, it has transitioned to um, sharing the experience through my own artwork. But the most amazing thing that's happened to me, this next adventure, my mission that I think I have now, uh, was being invited to participate in these spacesuit art projects which was a project where kids from pediatric cancer centers, we were collecting their art and building these spacesuits uh, out of it, and, uh, and they are wonderful. ILC Dover, the company that makes our suits, is volunteering to do this. Um, but this is a, a way, it's in the simplest terms, space-themed art therapy, working with kids around the world to do this. Uh, there's so much more to it, I think. These children through these projects are not only transcending the experience that they're having, let's see if I can make that work, there we go, that they're having in the hospital, which you hope is the worst thing they will ever deal with in their life. But through space, they are thinking about their own future. They're talking to you about what they want to do in the future. They're relating what they experience in the hospital to what I experienced in space by telling me, that little girl that was pointing to the sky, I remember her telling me, oh, Miss Nicole, you know, you don't get to see your mommy and daddy the same way when you're in space. You don't get to um, eat the same food. Your body's changing. There's this radiation stuff that's going on. All of these parallels that are so, so true. And you've seen in this picture kind of the compilation of the artwork through these kids around the world. Um, this suit, Unity, which flew to the space station, and you can see flying through the space station, uh, was built in all of the partner countries uh, of the International Space Station program. And uh, it's just incredible. Um, we were able to get some discretionary cargo space on one of the SpaceX cargo vehicles, and it went to and from the space station. It is now on display at the um, MD Anderson Cancer Center in, in Houston. Um, check out the Space for Art Foundation if you have the time to see all of the other projects that we have going on. This picture I show because I think, even though there's this wonderful science built into our spacesuits, and this is a poster that the Smithsonian does with their spacesuit collection. 
Uh, there is a beauty in our suits, in, in the technology, I think, that has always been there. But wouldn't it be cool if we could all have our own custom suit? You know, I think we'll be there someday, but this is just to kind of get that in your brain. I think that would be awesome. All right, so coming back to Earth, I think one thing you've probably heard from any astronauts that have spoken uh, during this week is that going to space, the experience, we might express it differently, but ultimately it brings us back to Earth. And I went to space thinking about Florida as my home, and I came home from space thinking about Earth as a planet, as my home. And this is another picture of Florida, but oh my gosh, you just recognize it as part of a planet. And there is no denying that this is a round planet. <laughs> uh, the other thing, <laughs> I think we will always, always still look for what's familiar. You know, this is Zurich from space, a really beautiful picture of Zurich from space. But this is also a picture of us from space. And regardless of whether it's where we've been able to go as human beings or where we've sent our robotic probes, our spacecraft, in this case, I think this was a picture from Cassini, we are in awe of what we learn about these new places. But the most awesome picture is the one where we find ourselves, like that little dot of light that's in this picture. And even these modern heavy metal kinds of versions of that, which you can like or not like, I guess, um, to me, the most beautiful thing about this is this reintroduction to the planet that's behind it. And I will close, like others have done throughout this week, with this one iconic image, which I think opened all of humanity's eyes to who and where we are in this beautiful universe as Earthrise. And I hope everyone, in one way or another, will experience their Earthrise moment and will be able to bring into your own life this idea these simple lessons that I learned in space, which are, we live on a planet, we are all Earthlings, and the only border that matters is that thin blue line of atmosphere that blankets us all. Thank you.